possession crucial from this. How much longer will the referee allow? Dublin lead by a point. Oh, and there's the whistle. It's over. It's over. We earned it by winning the last two matches on the road, and that's not going to be taken away from us. But what I love in hurling, I love players that will never give in. He hits it. He hits it. Right. It's over the bar. Hello, welcome to the RTGA podcast, Mikey Stafford here, hope you're all well. Um, all football this week, I'll be joined by, uh, as always, Rory O'Neill, by Kevin McStay and by a very happy Armagh man, Niall McCoy. How are we all doing, lads? Very good, Mikey. Very well, very very well Mikey. Good. Great yeah. weekend. Well, it's, well it's myself and Rory now are showing tremendous editorial responsibility to just kind of ditch hurling this weekend after Wexford and Cork <laughs> sauntered into the All-Ireland. Well, actually, Wexford sauntered, Cork kind of sidled sideways as if they were going through a turnstile. A bit of a saunter as well. I, I watched it. I mean, I know people were, the lads were saying, you know, oh, I, I, Cork farted about the place, to be honest with you, Mikey. I, I don't know. I don't know how much they were. I, I don't know how much they really put into that game, to be honest. And look, I think all the focus is obviously for this Saturday coming now. Yeah. yeah as Wexford. much as you can say about it. Yeah. Well, we'll discuss hurling at the, uh, on, on Thursday's podcast. Well, Wexford get to play Clare for the uh, Wexford uh, Clare or Wexford the, the hurling equivalent of Wicklow for the Wexford hurlers at this stage. You just seem to play them every championship. Unfortunately, we never beat Wicklow. We sometimes beat Clare, or sorry, vice versa. We sometimes beat Wicklow. We never beat Clare. Anyway, I digress. We're here to talk about football, and uh, we had the quarterfinal draw uh, this morning on Morning Ireland, as always, and um, it's a an interesting draw. It's uh, a great draw. Oshie mm-hmm. McGonville said last night he didn't care who, who Armagh got. And um, I'm looking at the draw, Kevin, and I think Armagh are the only team that won this weekend who I, I give too much of a chance. They're the only qualifier team I give too much of a chance against the uh, the provincial champions. Um, I'm not sure. Sorry, just for those who may not have heard it, it's Galway v Armagh, Kerry v Mayo, Cork v Dublin and Derry v Clare. So yeah, Kevin, I, I look at that and I say, Armagh have a good chance of upsetting my tips for the All-Ireland, but still, they are the team, they, they're the form team coming out of the qualifiers who've got maybe a provincial champion that not everybody's convinced by. Um, the draw hasn't been too kind to any of the other uh, qualifiers, I don't think. Yeah, I was, the first few hours of today, and I was polishing my piece for tomorrow's paper, and that's exactly where I'm at as well, Mikey. Um, it, ha- it, it makes this podcast so easy when I'm able to hack into your computer. Don't change your password. Our <laughs> yeah, definitely of uh, the four to emerge over the weekend uh, look the most likely. Uh, they'd have the best chance of success. Um, the Mayo uh, and a lot of asterisks beside them immediately. Cork and Clare, no. You can you couldn't see it, so yeah, I have to agree with you on that. The I suppose another way of looking at it is that uh, one of Galway, Armagh, Derry, and Clare will play in this year's All Ireland final. I think that's the big takeaway for me Brilliant, from yeah. the draw, um, and and that's fantastic. That isn't that's a fresh face, uh, one way or the other. And right now, you'd say probably the favourite would be the winner of the Galway Armagh game, uh, with Derry a dangerous opposition lurking there somewhere now that's being linear about our football mm. which it never can be of course uh, but all things point to it Armagh the story of I, I, I would have said the weekend but I might maybe further say the the championship it's 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 it seems to me and it's a team I've been following very very closely a team I did, like they're way up there one of my favorite teams and I'm not just jumping on the bandwagon now I've consistently been in that position and yet they've disappointed a few times. Uh, I'd have I'd have an, an awful lot of, of admiration for the, what I loosely call the the Kieran McGinley project. And it seems to me now that the uh, how many years it is, is six, seven, eight, nine. Perhaps he's been in charge. He's been there since two thousand and fourteen. He was in with Paul Grimley and he's, manager since two thousand and fifteen. So yeah. apart from Callum Collins, he's uh, who beats him by a few weeks. I think it's. Uh, it's a long time, isn't it? It's a long time. You don't, uh, yeah, you don't. it seems to me, my, my sense of it is that preparation has met opportunity. That you know, that's the way I I I I I'd look at that journey by McGinney and Armagh. That mm. uh, he's got a he has got his he's got his best team out, maybe missing one or two that you know if injuries tidied up and off the Willard, not now, but can tell us later, I'm sure. Um O'Neill's brother be one, Paddy Burns, these sort of fellas. Um but they're they're in great shape. 
but like all the winners this weekend, they come now to the quarterfinals with two wins on the trot. So the momentum of that, you know, is it, it is definitely momentum. And of course, you've kind of exercised the 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 the, the, the provincial defeat. You you parked that. You've moved on from that. You've moved well on from that now. And I was talking last week about this idea of, you know, when you're trying to make this massive breakthrough, Mikey, these things like statement wins. Mm. It's all right, you know, Armagh beating Fermanagh in a round one qualifier. That's grand. But beating Tyrone and following it up the week after with your nemesis, maybe, uh, Donegal, uh, that means something serious. Uh, And it really gives them a platform now. The draw has been... Uh, they've made their own breaks now because they've had to come back the hard way. So the draw has been uh, has been very decent to them. And is there an Armagh man, Niall, this morning who won't be dreaming of playing in this year's All-Ireland final? I doubt it. Oh, it was offering him, Kevin, as you said, uh, it's turning into a pretty brilliant championship, especially with the way this draw has went for the last eight. And uh, as Navarre Magoy, like three Division Two teams on their side of the draw now, they're the, the highest ranked side there. So very difficult, but and likewise, Galway are in Derry and Clare will not have massive fear or Armagh, but there's a clear path for Armagh to the final now. And if they play like they did the last two weeks, there's no reason why they can't be back in the final for the first time in what would be 19 years, you know. Um, mm. and actually, it'd be the, they haven't been in a semi final even since 2005, I don't think. So, you know, we think about that Armagh team, but it's a long time since Armagh have been past the quarter final stage, like, um. 2008 they won Ulster and then Wexford knocked them out and 2018 I think it was Throne gave them a tank in might have been 17 in Crow Park and they haven't really they got close to Donegal in 2014 but they haven't they haven't really troubled the semi-finals in, in a long long time so listen uh, there, there's a path there from Kevin no doubt yeah it's Rory it, it's it's an interesting draw in a few ways like the, the new championship structure is it's clearly evident um, you know we saw from the way the draw went for the first round of qualifiers that we we're going to lose two division one teams. And obviously there's the more cutthroat nature of the qualifiers means that, you know, as, as I pointed out, you've got, you, you know, you got one, two, three, four teams out of eight who were operating in division two last year and several of them are in division two next year, uh, including Dublin. And so actually if you count last year and this year, you're talking about five of the teams that operated in or going into division two. So, um, it's it's not lopsided. It's it's just a bit more mixed. Um, but what stands out to me is that we've been talking away about Galway v Armagh here for five minutes when one of the matches is Kerry v Mayo, oh, yeah. which I think says a lot about the the at least perceived trajectory of the two teams. I.e., one are going up and one are going down, and people perhaps don't see this as the Titanic tussle it has been for the last ten years. I think it's a like Kerry will probably. I, I... I'm only, you're only surmising, but you would get a sense that Kerry might be secretly happy with it in that that they didn't draw Clare, for instance, and find themselves in an All Ireland semi final maybe against Dublin and not really knowing where they are. I think they'll get a test here one way or the other. But they also need to be very careful. You need to be careful what you wish for, you know that type of cliche. I mean, I know we'll get onto the games in a minute. But again, Mayo, like Mayo just, Mayo can bring a box of crazy that nobody just seems to cut. Like they just, it, a button can get pushed sometimes. They will obviously have massive support. They'll outnumber Kerry again in wherever the game is played, most likely Croke Park. And you just never know it, Mayo. You just never, you just never know. I mean, look at them on Saturday, for instance. They looked bet all ends up. And within five minutes, they had a five point deficit turned around and mm-hmm. You know, like so, it it, it it it's a it's a again to go back to your initial uh, premise. This is a brilliant draw, I think, across the board. You know, I think we're going to get a couple of really good quarterfinals, which is as much as we could have hoped for, given the nature of the draw so far. And I think you're going to have two absolutely fantastic semi-finals, regardless of who makes it at this stage. Plus a hugely novel All Ireland final because whoever's in it, as Niall mentioned, is going to be in it for the first time in donkey's years, and that's good for football. Mikey, can I make a quick point <clears throat> just for we leave the, the the format and how it all yeah. goes? Isn't it gas? Uh, I was thinking about this this morning. Isn't it gas that after I think it's twenty two years or twenty one years of the qualifier formats, we've had four or five different 
different iterations, we'll say, over that period, that we happen upon the best one. And we make it the final one. <laughs> we never see it again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's classic. I, I know it's classic GA um, admin that uh, it took us this period of time to actually say, mm, yeah, we, could we get people to agree to take out the Talchin 16? Now, oh, geez, we have a right good qualifier now, lads. Okay, this will be the last time we do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's true. <laughs> there, there, there are quirks in it that, that yeah, probably don't yeah. sit too well, like the, the example of, you know, Tyrone or Bet by Derry, and there's still the same number of games away from an All Ireland final as they would have been so there are things about it but if, once you that's maybe more a provincial problem than a qualifier problem but um we'll, we'll a quick word on on cork rory um you, in, ter- you, in you terms of saying, the, in terms of the draw or the match at the weekend in ter- <laughs> it'll be both mentions will be quick but we can wrap it all in one if you want yeah, yeah. in terms of the the draw cork v dublin um the result is probably beyond doubt for oh, yeah, most yeah. of us who yeah. don't have West Cork blood coursing through our veins. But um, more interesting might be the venue. Would you think there'd be any opportunity for the GA to take the dubs on the road here? I think it would add such a novelty to the fixture. Like, let's be honest, right? So let's say the fixture goes ahead in Croke Park. There'll be, look, the Cork supporters are on their way up. The, they were in Belfast on Saturday, Turles this Saturday. Then they'd be expected to go to Dublin the following weekend. And then if the hurlers beat Galway, they're back up to Dublin the weekend after that again. So come on, you know, like let's, you have to cut people a small bit of slack too at times in terms of what you're expecting to support. And it's largely the same people that follow both codes that know people might, outside the Cork might think, oh, the hurlers and the footballers. That's actually not the case. They're generally, it's the GAA supporter. And you're just not going to get any Cork supporters that will come up to that game in Croke Park whereas if you actually sent the dubs down look they're going to win the game if you played the match on Ackle Island they'll win the match by probably (laughs) 15 to 20 points right but it would add such a novelty factor you'd have 25 or 30,000 dubs arriving down to Cork like what a brilliant occasion that would be you know it would be that you're probably close enough to Parky Queef full. The Cork supporters then would feel, oh, the dubs are coming down. We have to go out and show like that. They're not going to come down to our patch. And it would just add something to it. I think it would be a great opportunity to give football in a football urban heartland a big shot in the arm. And it would just create, a, as I said, a little bit more novelty around the fixture. And look, to be honest, the dubs, I'd say, would be nearly quite happy to go down to Cork. But look, I don't think it's going to happen, unfortunately. No. Do you do you have shares in an off license down in Cork City, Roy? Yeah, do you know, know what? <laughs> You'd be stocking up ahead of that one. <laughs> it, it, it'd be good. I'll tell you about good, Rory, because the minor draws worked out perfectly because you have Mayo Carey, I think, in the minors as well. So you could double build that. Um, you could have Cork, Dublin, standalone. And then you have Galway Derry meeting in the minors as well, and you could have a, an Ulster triple threat there as well. So I think there might, you know, there is the, I suppose, the room for for a bit of a bit of change. You know, I, I I'm like yourself, I wouldn't expect it, like, but but I, I think the minor fixtures have some there that they could actually change a wee bit, like, because I don't know if they're it'd be great down for the same weekend. Wouldn't we, um, wouldn't we be due to have Curry? Um... In Galway or something this time around for a quarter final. Yeah, yeah, instead of Limerick. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it's <laughs> yeah, true enough. Listen, let's let's get on to the games then, lads. And um, there's only one place to start, really. And I'll be glad to hear. Uh, Arma v Donegal, obviously. Arma winning three seventeen to sixteen points. And now, I'd say in your wildest dreams, you you now and a few of us here on the podcast are no fans of Donegal and think they're uh, about as reliable as a Romanian Rolex, but. Um, I don't think in your wildest dreams you could have seen a you know a ten point win you know pulling up with twenty minutes to go playing silly bugger hand passing around the middle of the field because there's just not a Donegal player who seemed to I think it was Oshin McConnell said they down tools last night and it's hard to argue against what Oshin said the last fifteen minutes of that match were farcical. I don't know about down and tools. I think they just uh, went into the most sort of agricultural panic station, slumped the ball in, and hoped for a. <laughs> A miracle, like a couple of miracles, they would have needed two or three goals. So I don't more acceptance maybe than down tools. Um, yeah, I, I tipped Rome to win by five or six. I thought Donegal would grind it out, so I'm gonna tip Galway next week. Or <laughs> you're going well, going well. No, I listen, Arma are excellent, Arma are excellent. And I was there, and I thought even five minutes before the penalty. I thought there was a big shift in the game. Donegal shooting in that first half was first class. Mm. Very little pressure, but they're still putting them over the bar well. But I just thought about five minutes for the penalty, 
Arma just seemed to get a real sort of control of that match, and you could just sort of see the you could see the game change, and you could see Ben Creeley and Stephen Sheridan starting to get a hold of things in midfield, um, looking a bit sharp. Arma they started slow enough against Strong too, did a lot of the ball, but were blocked down and stuff. They are generally slow starters. They had the goal of course, but then I think they conceded uh, six in the next seven points or something like that, or eight in the next nine, something stupid like that. But bar that spell, they, they, it's as good as they played under McGinney. Um, they defended well. They were very disciplined in their tackling, which is something that's always been thrown at them, which has improved this last two or three years immeasurably. And they're shooting, I think it was 67% I saw on the RT graphics there, yeah, so which is more than acceptable. Um, but there a few goal chances. That Stephen Campbell goal chance felt like something that, at the time, it felt like it's something we might regret, didn't come near that. This Armagh team, if you ask any fan after oh, during the McGinney era, did say that they have a real problem holding on to leads, but that's two weeks in a row against Division One opposition where they've been strolling by the full time whistle, which to me is very impressive. Um, you know, Rain O'Neill was superb. Uh, there's a couple of other men I thought were outstanding. I thought Jason Duffy was absolutely brilliant. I thought he was brilliant. And there's three men at the back. Uh, this attack, everyone's talking about the Armagh attack, but the three linchpins at the back uh, Aidan Forker, Arne McKay, and Greg McCabe, who have been playing fantastically mm. well. Um, often with their half backs, fellow half backs up in the attack, so they've been you know, short numbers at the back of time, but the three of them have just been performing so, so well. And that, as much as the attack has given them a platform to go and play that sort of football. And listen, we, we saw it in Bally Buffet, they played cautious, they dropped off and kick outs, bar those five minutes after half time, and it just didn't suit them. It didn't suit them. This is a team that just. Suits so front foot football, very little tactical sort of instructions. Just go out and play a good football, get it quick, forward quick, kick if you want to kick. And here, over the last two weeks, they've went from a team that looked down and out to a team now that we're talking about could potentially make an all-iron final. And that's some change in two weeks. Yeah, Ke- Kevin, it, it was night and day. Like, you learn, you know, the old cliche, you learn more from defeats than you do from victories. It's, it's certainly true, this Armada team. And... It couldn't be more true of any element of the game than, you know, the Donegal kickout, which you know, they suddenly realised. I think we were talking about it here before that, you know, you can't push up on Patton because he'll kick it 80 yards over your head. Well, I think I think Armagh realised that that was a risk they had to take because it seemed like Sean Patton did not want to kick the ball long, even though he has a foot like a howitzer. And it led to uh, that goal chance that was butchered by Soupy and then from the resulting 45 in the kickout, the penalty. Um and so pushing up on the Armagh kickout was gold, solid gold tactic rather than something to be feared. And that they obviously learned from defeat. I would say in general, even across the weekend, if you looked at it, even when Russ Common started to push up on the clear kickout, oh, every team that pushes up and is positive on the opposition kickout, number one, denies simple possession on the kickout. So that's a big plus immediately. Now, if you get a turnover, you're getting the tar- turnover where? High up the field, in the most dangerous place. And in the instance of Patton's turnover, it wasn't Patton's turnover, to be fair. I, th- I think it was McFadden Furry. Yeah, it was, a pass to, it was a pass uh, to the chest, touch. yeah. Yeah, the pass, was, the pass was, was more than decent, but the first touch, yeah. <clears throat> the first touch was, was poor. I've often, you know, uh, been saying uh, in a coaching context that when you, every defender that receives a ball with his back to the goal, and that's, his first instinct should never be to try and control it and deal with it. It should be to immediately give it back so that no contact is made. If you hold on to that ball for a tick, for two, a second, and guys come in on you and put heat on you, you know, they will go for your arms, hit your arms hard so the ball drops. And now there's, there's chaos. And that's exactly what happened. He dwelled for a moment at a little, slightly bad touch and they robbed him. Now the finish w- 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 was, was not good. In fact, I think he gave to the wrong. He gave to the wrong player. Really, there was one. One mm. on the right was was the better option. But the idea that they had decided were pressurizing it, were going for it. See, it, it says so many different things, Mikey, to your team and to your supporters. You're, you're saying exactly what Nigel said. We're going to play in front foot now. We're going to be positive in everything we do, and we're going to have a cut at it. And two things are going to happen. It's going to work out. Or he's going to go along, and we have to re, reshape then, and we'll deal with that if that's what we have to. But look, look at the source of scores when they're coming from these turnovers. Look at the look at the look at the mayhem, the cause co- the cause when you get that high turnover. For me, it's a it's a it's a no-brainer. And yet you see so many teams are conceding 
are conceding the kickouts. I, I was looking at the stats Johnny was sending us yesterday, mm. Rory, and so many mm. teams, short kickouts, 100%, short kickouts, 100%. And it, it's like you're saying, we don't care that you have possession. Well, that is not a very good starting position in, in my book. And it's been shown over this weekend, uh, in particular, when Ross Common went after Clare when they got it, when, when they were in trouble to, and they went after building up their lead and started pushing up, they got great joy on it. Likewise, Armagh. Now, it takes energy. I totally accept that. And it takes discipline and people picking their spots, whether it's a zonal push-up or a man-to-man push-up. And you have to have players, you know, you can't be celebrating goals and waving at the crowd. you got to be back on point, doing your job. Where's my man? And all that. And it does take practice in, in, in the training ground. But I must say, Armagh executes it to a very high degree yesterday. And it gave them an immediate position in the game. Even if you take the, the positivity of the throw-in. Like, you know, other teams, they bring up a goalie to take that free that they win at the throw-in. But yeah. no, Neil gets it, cracks, he said, I'm banging it in. He didn't pick out Grugan in particular, Nile. I mean, Mernon would have been the more obvious one to me. He's, he's even tired in the year. Yeah, it was like, a speculative. It, it was, was pretty correct. speculative. It's, it's, like, it's, yeah, it, yeah. But it was beautifully... It's a perfect flight. It's a great story. forwards ball. It's yeah, a gorgeous yeah, yeah, ball. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. like I'd nearly catch it myself at five foot nine. Yeah, yeah, hanging yeah, yeah, you know, it's a gorgeous yeah. ball. And once he catches it, and uh, I can't just recall who, who was it, Mac, not McMenamin, um, McCall maybe, oh, that jumped was, with him. Yeah, McCall jumped with him. Yeah, yeah, so when he's in the air, but you're already down, he's out of the game. Yeah. And yeah, then he turns finish. and puts it back in the opposite direction. So all those positivities, yeah, starting with the push up on, on the kick out. I, I, like that's what it seems to me that our are about. Yeah, Kevin, I, I, I've had a question I've been dying to ask uh, a, an intercounty manager since yesterday afternoon. Oh, so you're the only one on the call. So excuse me for a second. Lads. Your goalkeeper gets a black card. You can't replace him for the penalty. Midfielder goes in goal. Makes a very good stab at saving it. Doesn't save it. Why in the name of jumping Jesus do you burn two substitutes and take off your marquee corner forward for the sake of 10 minutes when is there could you is there not an outfielder who could take the kickouts and field any high balls whereas instead Declan Bonner burned two substitutions which may have been important later in the game to bring in um his sub goalkeeper Lynch for 10 minutes to me that was that was nonsensical I don't okay, know so is there a reason for it oh absolutely there's a reason for it so you've obviously never been a county manager and had to deal with the consequences of telling your goalie you're number 16, but you're not really. Okay. <laughs> so uh, you, you're, you have a great relationship, obviously, with your with your panel. And here you, I'm uh, number 16 should, most of the time. I'm I'm okay with uh, it. No, no, it's okay. We, we have a fella already selected to take your place. It's all right. And what, what have I been around the panel for for the last uh, three years? It's a very, very tricky one. I, look, the maths of it are, you're correct, 100%. But the human side of it... He's the sub goalie, Mikey, and now you're telling him in his in his great moment of opportunity. No, we're actually going with the midfielder, and uh, uh, they didn't even ask him to take his jersey off. I noticed to give it to him, um, which was probably decent in the circumstances. Yeah, uh, he, I mean, if you go down that road, you'll be looking for sub goalies fairly rapid. So I, I think there was an element of certainly keeping morale at a, at a reasonable level. I couldn't, Jesus, Mikey, you, you're really using people. Uh, what, what, would would you not be terrified of a couple of so uh, a couple of players going down with the game in the melting pot in the second half? Then Kevin, you're you're too, you've well, got two substitutions left. Yeah. But I mean, it's uh, it's sport is a human is a human endeavor, you know. It's, Jeez, uh, Kevin, I never thought you were so soft hearted. This is a whole new side to you. That, that's seeing. my that, that's my that's my problem, Mikey. <laughs> <laughs> what, what I thought what I thought was interesting was that it was McBrarty that was. Uh, well, that was shocking. I mean, uh, geez, because yeah. it it it'd be moving okay. He seemed to be moving. I didn't. I was thinking he wasn't maybe, happy. He wasn't happy about He wasn't either. happy. No, Jesus. he definitely wasn't happy. But <laughs> I I I I want to more know about the decision to take off with Brarty, To be honest with you, Mikey, I was sort of like he when I saw him going off as a normal fan, I was delighted to see him going off. You never want to see Paddy McBrarty on the ball like as a as an, a, an opponent. And I was like, are the has he a knock? Were they maybe saying right, give this by ten minutes of rest, and we'll. We'll get more out of him. That to me was the more interesting dynamic of the whole thing. That was like Brarty that was sacrificed essentially. He was essentially sinned in himself for 10 minutes, you know. And as an Arma fan, you know, I was there as a fan not working, so it's allowed to be biased, but I was delighted to see him go off, to be honest with you, because he's just an absolute class act. Yeah, but what do you think, Rory? Because obviously it was a pivotal moment in the game, the, the penalty alone, but also, you know, a black card in the game, you know, that was as tight as that at that stage. And then 
to double punish yourself, you lose your goalkeeper and decide to take off probably your your, your most threatening forward. It was just it was I, the whole thing was strange to me. It was it was. But you, do, do you know? Look, it's only an all it's only a personal theory. Um, it's not based on any real logic or any sort of science or any data. I just have a sneaky feeling that that COVID championship Ulster final that Donegal got sucker punched by Cavan has left an indelible scar on them in a way that I don't think they've ever recovered from. And if you look at last year's championship, particularly something very similar happened to them against Tyrone as well, in that the whole game just blew up on them in the space of a maybe 30 or 40 seconds. They missed a penalty with Michael Murphy. And then a couple of seconds later, he gets sent off and then just busted. And they'd been playing well. And similarly to yesterday, they were actually playing really well for the first 20 minutes. Like they were kicking some incredible scores from range. They had settled down. They'd absorbed the early shock of the, that, that really fast start from that incredible goal. And in the space of a minute, just to, and uh, what, what, what it said to me was just in terms of, we'll say um, there's maybe a frailty there that it all got derailed so quickly, so suddenly, and it's just a residue maybe of a few different defeats. I think maybe the particular one against Cavan, I think is probably the one that really ranked us because look, let's be honest, they're a better side than Cavan. They should never have lost that game. Mm. So I'm it's just interesting I, as well, lads, um, to just build on that, on the black card moment. Um, mm. Is that and I don't have the I don't have the numbers on it, but I I know from just even the last few weeks, the commentators or the stats lads just feeding us the sort of damage that's been done. Like it's of the order of about oh. five points, four yep. or five points. Yep. Like it was one is. three in the Cork Limerick game yesterday as well. Okay. Though. Yeah. So it's it's of that order, and similarly with with their armada that you 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 know like two things happen definitely when you're on the black card, your offense. Is removed because you have to bring back you have to bring back somebody obviously, uh, so your offense is pretty much wiped, and then you're defending for your life, uh, and you're trying to kill the clock. And of course, we're seeing more and more of these head injuries now. They're just there. There's a proliferation of them <laughs> at this stage, and uh, we we'll, we we'll need we we'll, we we'll need ER units beside the grounds fairly soon. And got it in the throne arm too, Kevin Richie Donnelly got it. Uh, throne just tried to run the ten minutes down. Um, I think the teams might have been one one, a point apiece over ten minutes. But it was at a time in the game where Tyrone really needed to <clears throat> get back in it. It was the ten minutes after t- half time, or you know, just Ooh. after that, and it was a critical period where Tyrone needed to stage or start their recovery at least. But it turned mm. into ten minutes where they just passing the ball back and forth, and yeah. both teams were happy enough sort of to get through the ten minutes without going arm hour for or enough ahead. Or they didn't have to push it too far. Yeah. Throne just needed to stay in the game. But I felt it's, that it's that definitely period, a moment though. Yeah, it, I, I felt it, that took away Throne's chances to uh, last weekend, you know. So these yeah. black cards are having huge seasons, Yeah. Like, so Niall, um we mentioned it there, the Ken mentioned at the start the injuries, because obviously we're all quite impressed with our map, but there are a few players who could be could be back in, in a fortnight's time, is that right? I think I think most of them are done for the for the season, Mikey, to be honest with you. Um Paddy Burns, I think, might be about the only one you might see back into the free against uh, Galway. They have Grimley, I think, is done for the season. Uh, Tiernan Kelly, who is playing really well during the league, is definitely done for the season. Kieran Mackin, bad eye injury, had a tremendous league from nowhere, done for the season. Apologies, Connor Mackin. Connor Mackin be okay, won't he? Yeah. yeah, he was down. It was a strange one, yeah, so he was announced to start. Mm. Uh, and then... Pulled out again last minute. I think there was word of maybe an injury in the warm up. Connor O'Neill came back in, and given those circumstances, performed very well for a young Indeed. lad. Mm. You know, I, I don't and know. What is she O'Neill? Is he around the, the scene? I don't think it's just looking at him. Yes, and now he, he was doing. Uh, he was do, he was on the line doing water boy, and to me, he didn't look like a boy that was close to coming back. Like you know, uh, like the yeah. Paddy Burns and all seemed to be involved with the bench. Oshin was out. Him and Brent Donaghy were the water carriers. Yes, uh, and. To me, look like a fella that's not going to be involved anytime soon. It could be wrong in that one. There hasn't been real clarification on that, but I wouldn't be expecting to see him, Kevin. And to have so that that'd be four or five boys who'd definitely be pushing for starting spots. And maybe that might be something that'll 
that'll come back and, and hurt them a wee bit down the line. But uh, mm. we'll see. The boys have stepped in and done very well. To be Mikey, fair. Mikey, just one. Uh, I don't know if you're moving on now from mm. Armad and the goal, but <clears throat> one final point. What a what a buzz they bring. I mean, they have unbelievable support and that you can sense now that the entire county is behind them. I mean, the crowds they brought yesterday, they must have outnumbered the Donegal supporters, I would say maybe three or four to one. The noise that they bring, the razzmatazz, it's really great for Gaelic football to have Armagh now, I think, ready for a sustained period at the top table. And I think they just bring great excitement they bring great color there's um there'll be they're, they're going to add so much now to the latter stages of the championship they're a fantastic team to watch i think in rian o'neill they have a player that is potentially Rory. potentially is, at the yeah, clifford potentially yeah. at the clifford yeah. con o'callaghan level you know like he, that's how good he was yesterday anyway um what a player and like you know i just yeah i think they're a very exciting team for gaelic football mm, across agreed. the board agreed the one if we could just one quick thing super fan <laughs> base one thing i didn't like yes uh, a lot of booing on donegal freeze i don't know where that came across and TV, but did certainly you, on our side you. of the ground, there was mm. a lot of it. Well, you we couldn't hear him over the Vuvu Zaylas. Did you bring oh, the Vuvu Zaylas? Yeah, yeah, serious amount to them. That's worse than the Vuvu. Oh my thing. god, they love a Vuvu Zayla. Love. I thought they were out. I thought they were outlawed by now, but they're still stuck in. There'll be there'll be a motion. There'll be a motion in due course. <laughs> oh, and it would get it would get about a hundred percent back in it. It could be the first. Oh my god, those the noise yeah. of those things. My god, yeah. and actually, after a while, they become like. You become kind of uh, immune, immune to them, yeah. and then every now and again you realise they're there, and you say, Geez, "They're still going." Oh, Mikey, I was sat in traffic in Clonus for about an hour. You know how hard it is to get out of it, and they were still going all the way down the street. Like, <laughs> like, you know, it's still going. You're like, "Give us a break, lads!" Jesus, where where's this black market? Is, 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 <laughs> 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 maybe the Northern Ireland Protocol will sort this yeah. out. Jump maybe... to markets return. <laughs> <laughs> okay, look, we'll we'll move on to one of the Saturday matches. Um, uh, your shower, Kev, your 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 original shower, Mayo, uh, two thirteen to fourteen point winners over Kildare. Um, in classic fashion, Kevin, they did not make things at all easy for themselves. Um, a late goal put a gloss on it, but this was uh, this was uh, getting their arse out of the bacon slicer territory yet again, wasn't it? Yeah, it did. Like I mean, all over the shop, mad as a box of frogs. And uh, <laughs> and then you know and then I, I you know I was I was watching it on my iPad and I'm saying I just I, I'm in isolation up in the top room right? I'm saying out to my daughter dog can't see it now and the next thing to get a goal of the season oh, and yeah. within minutes it's turned around and uh, they are they are they're mercurial what can I say mm. we are we are the great entertainers Mikey and uh, you you can't count, count us out really Kev Kev. Sorry to cut Let's across talk. there. I just, okay. I just, it was just because I just had it in my head. Do you remember an advertising campaign years ago, and it was like, you know, when you've been tangled. Do you rem- do you remember? Do you remember that? Yes, tango yeah. orange yeah. drink. Yeah. Like, Kildare, 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 yeah, you know when you've been tangled and the guy would appear on the screen out of nowhere and he'd slap the guy's the other guy's face and then disappear again and you just Kildare got mailed on, <laughs> Kildare got mailed yeah, yeah. on Saturday night and I'd say they're probably waking up today going what happened what actually happened yeah. <laughs> you know it was very Psycho. you know it was very um uh very interesting from the Kildare perspective is that and you might remember this Rory. I don't know, did you do the match with us? Westmead and Kildare in the semi-final. Myself and Wheelow were on doing it. And we were we were just said, Kildare are a washout. They might have just beaten Westmead, but their defence is so horrendous. Yeah. Like, they don't... They were 2-15 against Westmead. Oh, it was, it? Yeah, it was yeah. crazy. Like, they were, like say, down, this, down this channel, sir, if you'd like, if you'd like to... If go, <laughs> goals go down this way. Points after you, this sir. Way. And uh, after you, sir, and nobody laying a hand on anybody. And I remember we both said that, I, like, if they didn't improve, Dublin would murder them. And, of course, they did. Uh, and then they decided, and they didn't have that much time now, and I have to give them massive kudos, uh, because it's not an easy thing to do, to redraw their defence uh, and get buy-in uh, and actually get people now to make contact for a change. And when runners and guys have to be tracked or hit, that people come out and actually hit them, you know, and stop them in their tracks. Uh, so I have to give a big plus 
to to Kildare there, and they did everything. Uh, but here here's here's what got them. The same thing that's been getting Mayo for I've often argued fifty years. Their just inability to even get decent return from basic opportunities. So when they were five six up, I just to pad that out to eight or nine, um, and they showed a few of them on the show last night. Yeah. Some of the efforts were appalling. Now they were lucky in that Mayo will go up the other end of the field and match those appalling efforts. So that keeps you in the game because Mayo give everybody a chance, as you know. Yeah. Uh, and um, and it just happened that that single one moment, which by itself was a bit of a keystone cops, really. You know, Oshin Mullen, he's tangled up with three fellas and the next thing a Kildare fella hits them and turns them in the right direction and puts them clean through. And the next thing a one-two and the ball is in the net. And that one moment, there you go. They're tango, they're mayo, they're, they're just <laughs> yeah, hit, it, it hit is. in the face. It, it, it's it's, it's a peculiar back. phenomenon that only mayo <laughs> can bring. Uh, like, yeah. You, like they're, they're, you have to recall, Mikey, that mayo are kind of, they're, they're living on scraps. Or they're like, they're really breathing fumes now at this stage because with, with injuries, that's one side of it. But morale and, and confidence is the bigger side of it. That I, I think even the supporters are finding it difficult to believe in their progress and that it's kind of living to die another day sort of thing. Um, which is probably a little bit unfair because yeah. to keep going, to try and eke out the victory, you know, if it was any other team, you'd be saying, my God, that's some achievement. But they did, they did, did keep at it because that is what Mayo do. They keep yeah. going on, don't they? Mm-hmm. Uh, and they got the little break then that now I jump in ahead and I'm looking at the draw and I'm saying, well, now, yeah, look, everybody realizes that they'll be put out of their misery now, except for the people that probably uh, inhabit that bubble. Mm. They'll be thinking, well, Ryan, I don't know, can we get him back now? We we get a good uh, defense. We, we've played them. Gordon Flynn got, a, got some minutes. Yeah. I mean, uh, and no team has won. Is it, did I see that stat there? That is this the third time Perry would have to beat Mayo this season? <clears throat> and the other teams haven't been able to do it. Ross Common couldn't do it against Galway. Donegal. Uh, Donegal yeah. couldn't do it against Armagh. Like um, familiarity does breed a, a, a little contempt, all right. But no, I think on, on all known evidence, uh, it's the end. It looks like the end of the road. But that's not to say that their victory over Kildare was, you know, a victory for resilience and staying at it and not so not so not uh, not thrown in the towel, or, or as we often say, wash, washing the shovels early and going home for the Friday yeah. nights. So they uh, they stayed at it and. Uh, well, be careful what you pray for. They've got Perry in the, in the court. They, yeah. have an, they have an athleticism, though, Mikey. They are one of the few teams that have an athleticism that will be able to stay with Kerry. They maybe don't have the quality that Kerry have, particularly up front, as we know. But they will certainly match Kerry stride for stride in, a, in an athletic department. That's the big... That's When you start getting further up the, the mountain, that's usually the stuff that kind of starts... Yeah, that's an absolute... ...driving the... Yeah the gap in between teams. And I think may all have that at least, but yeah. Yeah. So what we have here is a, a team where over your lines on the forays forward of ponytail defenders to score, um, athleticism, uh, never say die attitude, uh, a lack of scoring forwards, but in Killian O'Connor, a very reliable free taker. And right. No, don't know who may be uh, fit. Yeah. So what we have, Niall, this is basically the same Mayo template we've had for the last 10 years, which tends to get them into all Ireland finals. Why why the mood music so negative about them this year, do you think? I I I I'm a bit more optimism. Um the pandemonium that Mayo brings, I as I just watching, it's just it's fantastic. It's brilliant. Um I it was, it was amazing. Like I was I was covering the match with Tracker for RT there and I think it was midway through the second half and I looked at the scoreboard and it was still three points as had been the gap at half time, it was like may have no made no inroads here at all. And then next thing Daniel Flynn runs through and we go from a potential goal of the season to a point at the other end and it just felt like a big moment. It just kept the game alive. And then Mayo, such a reactionary team, once they get their, their wind up, they just go for it. And I, 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 I don't know. They're going to bring that chaos into the into the next match. And here, listen, they, they don't have the quality probably, but if they get their tails up, there there's probably no better county in in the country for just going for it once they start getting a bit of confidence. But they're so poor for fifty minutes, like you know, for fifty minutes they're absolutely awful. And and Kevin talked about it there. They can learn to defend and compared to previous games, so it was first class. And even the start of the second half, Michael Grady threw himself and made a great block at the oh, very yeah. start. And yeah. 
it, it did look at the, the camera pan to James Horn at one stage and he's very dejected looking and it just looked like we were going and then Mayo did what Mayo do and just find this source of energy where all bets are off and it just turns in and you can just feel the crowd closing in you can just see some of her players growing a foot and and to be fair to Horn he made some big switches um you know I, I, I thought Boland done I think he got two points when he came on possibly um they done very very well and they're also going now, if, uh, one, one other thing to add to the athleticism uh, and uh, and the resilience of the team there's, there's one other massive factor in their favor and I'm not now trying to construct uh a debate where, whereby Mayo are, are favourites to win this or anything. But Mayo will match up very well with Kerry. They would they would have the players very naturally, like a lot of teams think, oh, it's Clifford and Ganey and the other Clifford. But Mayo have, have Durkin, they have Mullen, they have uh, Swanee O'Hora, Parik O'Hora if the needs be. Uh, young Hessian, who made that block you were talking about on Daniel Flynn Nile. Mm-hmm. He, he's a marvellous young footballer. He, he could actually be pushed up on someone like Gavin White if that's what Mayo required, if we wanted legs on him. So Mayo will match up very, very easily and very, very well. And, and let's not forget, there is still, for all the brilliance of this Kerry team, there is still that question mark over them. Um, you know, that COVID season obviously was, a, as we saw in Ulster and Monster that year, it was a, it was a, it was a strange old year, but... Yep. The throne match last year, you know, throne were probably going in as equally as big underdogs as as Mayo won this match, and throne got the job done. Clifford going off, it, it you know, with injury seemed to really just sort of stifle them. And listen, there there is a few question marks, and I, you know, would Kerry be happy to get Mayo? I'm, I'm just not so sure there would be, um, because you just do not know what you're going to get with Mayo. They're an unquantifiable team. Um, you just cannot work out what. Good man, Niall. He's getting the mail for Sam. Mm. That <laughs> campaign going for twenty twenty two. I will die a happy man if we get an arm on Mayo All Ireland final. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. could, could you imagine the, the scramble for tickets there. would be yeah. obscene? Yeah. Um, oh. Another another intercounty f- uh, manager question for you, Kev. Um, I had to laugh at James Horan's raging against the um the squad list um rule which he calls one of the craziest rules that ever existed where you have to name your uh name your 26 on a thursday and it can't change even if you know two players get injured on thursday night and so he was down to 24 for a squad like declan bonner he was down two substitutes um i had to laugh because i said james it's you and your ilk who brought in this rule <laughs> like if you didn't name nonsense squads and nonsense teams for the last 20 years the ga wouldn't have bothered bringing in this rule and you wouldn't have to worry about it so it did make me chuckle i was wondering what you thought of it well, I, I, in my experience was i was getting a phone call from the secretary at about 10 to 9 on thursday and said, <laughs> where's the bloody team you told me you'd give it to me at half eight <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and then, of course, you, you'd, you'd print some fella's name twice on the list and uh, it always led to some nonsense. But um, I know where he's coming from, but exactly like you said, they seem to have forgot who were the guys that brought this about. Uh, uh, and I think, in fairness to Ross Common at the time, you can't point the finger at us. We were we were reasonable enough in our efforts. But um, the, the one side of it is the illness side of it, which, I, you know, the, the rule falls down in terms of people getting ill. Um, but isn't 24 surely enough for any man? <laughs> I wouldn't have thought. <laughs> I mean, if you're bringing in number 27 and 28, you're probably not going to be playing them anyway, I don't think. Uh, but I, 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 hear, I hear the point he's saying about the rule. It's not a great rule, uh, but the, uh, you, you made the point for us. <laughs> the reason the rule is in is because of... It's just like the Mayor Fornikev, you know, the reason that got dispensed with was because was managers were abusing it, exactly. Yeah. 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 So you can't have, you can't have it every way. No, you can't have it every way. But that's I think I think to be an intercounty manager, store, you have to want it every way, and you have to actually yeah, have the wherewithal to, to make it yeah. to have it every way. Okay, let's move on to your other shower then, Kev. Um, our day at the office, Claire two fifteen, Ross Common, one one seventeen. Um, another cracking game. Uh, you know, Croke Park. Um. Uh, might have been full, but you know it was treated to a couple of uh, a couple of tasty encounters and. Um, I just kept there's no there's no other way to look at this but your your former charges are, are, are a little bit like Kildare going to be wondering how it came to this what were they five points up in the 69th minute mm. you shouldn't lose from that position should you no no the, like I mean I saw Anthony Cunningham on the show last night and he just said he's got it and you can imagine like you're five points up you have to be thinking the game is yours Um, you know there's players back in position these things should not happen 
uh, and when you look back on it as you know we all do down here because we're invested in the team and you're doing the replays and stopping and slow mos and everything you're looking at the fine print of it and it's a it, it's a, a result of an issue that Russ Common have had well, I would say going back 10 years plus now at this stage 20 years is the lack of really straight up committed defenders that we we just don't have them and uh, there's a big issue when you have you know a lot of your defenders who don't <laughs> actually uh, go around looking for contact that they're happy to play areas without engaging an, a, an opponent it gives too much time on the ball and uh, like a scoreline of 117 not to win a qualifier game you know should mm. should not happen and the big issue and you know and th this comes through my period in charge as well so i'm not trying to I'm not trying to be, be, be silly about the issue, right? And I can go back quite a while now to a lot mm. of managers here in the county. <clears throat> and the issue is that while managers and managements, you know, of course give huge um, uh, concentration on, on defense and defensive structures, you have to have players that are committed to, the, to that structure, but most importantly, committed to engaging opponents when they breach it. And that is that is where Roscommon so badly fell down, not only in the Connacht final, uh, and I was sure it would be tidied up and well, certainly a better effort. But yesterday I could I could have picked you 10 clips, Mikey, where a clear player comes through and the Roscommon sweeper is 30 yards further back on the 20 meter line, not even close to engagement. There's no hard tackling going in, it's all shadowing. It's guys just trying to push them down the channel, but they forget that if they just you know, shaky and, and make any sort of room. Like in Crow Park, you'll, you'll score easily from 35 metres out if there's no pressure on you. And that was the killer for us common yesterday, that they have a very tidy uh, attacking unit who, who weren't hectic yesterday, by the way, had plenty of wides, uh, or, or on Saturday, excuse me, had plenty of wides, but still scored 117. But at the other end, they're just conceding it way, way too easy. And that's what catches you. Uh, in the end, and you know, I I I, I suffered uh, uh, that myself. I wasn't able to I wasn't able to bring it together either. It's a it's an ongoing issue where Roscommon really have to get their hands on out and out defenders, footballers that like defending first and foremost, rather than going up the field playing lateral, easy mm. on the eye, foot passing and hand passing. That's we, we were singing the praises of Brian Stack here a few weeks ago. He he, he would be one, I guess, who, who fulfills the criteria. Yes, and young Murray in the corner, even though he had a tough, tough day, you know, my experience of both of those fellas, I, and th thanks for, for mentioning it. I, mm. I wouldn't want to think everybody, but we had too many. Yeah. Uh, uh, there was common lads. There was just too many of them. And that's not been hard and they'll know this themselves like even the winning point you know the uh, was kicked well, wait there should have been players i mean could you imagine trying to get that winning kick against armar donegal in a frantic game he'd have been smothered you know and poor old jamie uh, malone would be having his head reattached a, it was some this morning kick. <laughs> it was some kick no kick. it was fantastic yeah, kick, yeah, yeah. but rory in the context of the game this yeah. is the final possession he ran through three would-be tackles you yeah. know you know, Fokker are, are, uh, are one of these type of guys would be out on top of you and have the head pulled off you. You just wouldn't get the shot off. You know, you'd have to, you'd have to recycle it. It was just too easy. And then if you look at the, the, the free, the sideline free where young Murray got caught for over carrying, I think he throws the ball over the line. The ball is brought into the 14 and it's a tap over. And that gives clear a little spark just mm -hmm. that it could happen. Then they get the free from a silly turnover. Yes, you know, so all these things. I know the detail of them because I've invested. So yeah. uh, uh, all these little things add up, and now the five point lead isn't unsurmountable uh, at all. And yeah. uh, and off to go. But huge, huge uh, compliments to Claire because I, I always make this point: you ain't be, you ain't going to be getting those winning scores at the end unless you're trying to get them. Mm -hmm. And Claire were trying to get them. They got the peno. Great call by the ref. I thought he had missed it, but uh, and and Rossa got away with it. But no. And then from there, unlike the Duddy Gall situation that I, we commented on some weeks mm. ago, they said, damn it, this might be our best chance. And they went for it. Yeah. So well done to them. But a, a, a big, a, a big, big defeat for Roscommon. It's going to, you know, the older players now are going to have to have a peep for themselves. Management are going to have a, have a peep for themselves. A lot of navel gazing now for, for the next few weeks and months.
Yeah, absolutely. Um, Nyla, but cre- credit where it's due to Claire and um, I guess the man of the moment is, is Keelan Sexton, you know, to yeah, score so to score two six in Croke Park it is fair going. Uh, okay, one five from Freeze, but there was one one and his goal, which he took very nicely. Again, it might have been a product of some fairly uh, lax Ross yeah, Common defending when he was able to run across the goal. But, you know, he, he's a young enough fellow, I believe, um, and he has amazing composure. It was a fantastic the kick. The, the kick from six or uh, from forty seven eight meters mm. was, was some kick. That was uh, that was a pressure kick and, and and well done to him. Like it was it was of the Rain O'Neill quality, wasn't it? His performance, you'd have to say. So yeah, um, yeah I uh, think so. But his 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 goal, the goal he got from Clay, again, if you go back to the fine detail of it, Roscommon had that ball trapped on the end line yeah. and yeah. walked away from the contact. You know, instead of getting in and doubling up and getting an overcarry. They backed off and let him let him get his uh, lovely jink pass across the goal, and then sex and fair play tidied up. Yeah. I actually I was watching the match, and at, when that move was progressing, I actually turned away from the TV to look at something because I thought it'd been the move had been closed down, and then looked mm-hmm. up and it's in the net. It's like how did that actually happen? Like top teams simply would not, as you see, they had it boxed off there, like it was uh, it was blotted out, yeah. and it still ended up in the net. And those are the the wee details that get you, like. But listen. Uh, like you said it there, you know, credit to Sexton and Clare and Colin Collins. Like, and I'm not sure many seasons they're a very established Division Two team at this stage. And I feel like Clare maybe just don't get, and they will now obviously maybe get the respect and I suppose praise for what they have done over this last six or seven years. Because you know, some people are seeing that as a major shock. Like, but Clare are uh, Clare being Division Two now for it must be five seasons at this stage mm. like and mm. Russ Common obviously been up and down between one and two it's, it's not as if they're uh well, I didn't three. necessarily see it as a massive upset no, no I'll be honest no. there Niall I thought it was yeah it was against the odds to a degree but I wasn't you know stop the whole the front page on it you know yeah, and that's the thing like they're going to go in as huge underdogs to the Derry match but ideal for them again it is ideal and they've been, mm. they've been operating at a higher level than Derry over this last number of years Derry being in four and three and, and Clare being consistently in two now obviously in us their title changes that of course mm. the way Derry are playing this year they're rightly going to be big favourites but again it's, it's beautiful for Clare going into that quarter final you know there's going to be no one tipping them no one's going to give them a the chance Derry haven't played what will it be must be a long, long time between Derry's Ulster final and months, this match. Yeah. Probably a month, I'd say. Probably yeah. a month. Yeah. So that's that's a long time out, Kevin. You'll know. I two weeks is probably your optimum. Yeah. You know, yeah. a yeah. month out. Twenty twenty ninth of May to the twenty um, sixth of June. That's a yeah, month. Yeah. That's a month. That's a long time without a competitive match, no matter what you're doing in training. Yeah. And as you say, Clare have come in with two victories. They're going to have that two week gap, which I think most managers would agree would be the perfect. perfect. Yeah, that's so, perfect. I think it's, I'm not saying Clare are going to beat them, but I, I certainly wouldn't be giving them the no hope status going in this quarter final because they're a good team. And I saw them a couple of years ago against Armagh. It's actually played in Yuri because I don't know what Armagh did that time, but they've done something anyway. And they have some good forwards, Clare, like Turbidy and all. They're just, they were excellent that day. And Sexton has just seems to be able to propel them to the next level. So mm. I, know Con- I thought O'Connor was worth a mention too. I thought he was first class, especially. Yeah, they will. Class. Oh, they're talking to four though, Rory, and as Pat pointed out, Pat's plan pointed out on Sunday game last night, the winning score by Jamie Malone was their first point from play in the second half. So um, they have good forwards. They're just they're, they're going to have to make more use of them if they're going to beat Derry. They might necessarily need too many scores from play against Derry either. <laughs> you know, like that's the reality of it. They probably, you know, that could. It just depends, I suppose, on Derry's approach. Um, but uh, yeah, well, they'll, they'll be they'll be hot rodding. On to Keelan Sexton anyway. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. Chrissy McCaig is sharpening as we speak, I'd say, or someone like that. Uh, it, McCaig's it, it, an all star territory at this stage, like, mm-hmm. you know, and he, he'll he love that. Like, you, you, you got to assume that McCaig will, the way he's playing, be able to wrap him up. So, what do you do there, Rory? Like, if, if Sexton is wrapped up, how, how do Claire actually compete there? Yeah, with I said, yeah, with, with a lot of difficulty, I would imagine. Maybe do you, do you, do you try and get a squeeze out of Tuberty from the start? Just to maybe take the workload off him and do a Peter Canavan job, bring him, you know, bring him off, give him a rest, and then bring him back on because he look Tuberty still has something to offer. He just doesn't probably have seventy minutes, and they are like they don't have enough strings to their bow to make that unbelievable defensive machine that Derry is. 
worry all that much, I would imagine. But look, you know, look, I still think, I think you outlined a very good case for them there to not go in, in comparison to, we'll say, one of the quarterfinals, certainly, we, which will remain nameless. I don't think it's a no-hope situation for them. And it'd be an interesting contest, but you would assume that Derry would have just that little bit more, you yeah. know, they have a bit more noose about them to get the job done. Speaking of that no-hope uh, quarterfinal, yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, let's get on quickly to talk about the, the the fourth of the qualifiers. It seems to be fourth in every which way. It wasn't a bad game, actually. It was quite interesting. It, was quite it, it, it wasn't, but it just didn't seem to quite be the standard of the yeah. other, of the yeah, other games. Um, Kevin... Cork scored 218, you know, so should they take the Kildare approach now of the Leinster final and oh. turn their quarterfinal into a shootout wherever it's played? Cork being Cork will probably fancy their chance. <laughs> <laughs> we go toe-to-toe with these jackies. And, and, and they'll probably go up and say, look, we're going to play the way we play. Let Dublin do what they want. Uh, anyway, no, I, 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 I joke. Um, well, it's funny, not actually, that much night, of a joke. <laughs> <laughs> what, what was funny last night was uh, I thought it was um, John Cleary was saying afterwards. You know, we we we'll probably be written off by everybody, and he said, and we probably deserve that. Well, he could have left out the two probably. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because, uh, Cork, uh, Cork are you know they're on almost mission impossible. I, I would have thought the standard is just not there, and hasn't been there for a long time. Uh, and that's not now to be stamping on Cork. There, I, I, I love Cork as a as a sporting county. Um, they they they've been off the standard for a long, long time. You know, um, their their best uh, their best uh, hope, I guess, would be to see could they could they generate the dander that they had for the first fifty minutes against Kerry, set a few short term goals. You know. To, to achieve in the first half of, of the game and see could they, you know, keep it tight and competitive. Now, you know, if they had another five or six, seven Sean Powters, they would because he, you saw what he does when, when he goes after uh, after a ball. He's hugely committed and he's the sort of tear away uh, physical defender that Cork need loads of. But the problem is they just they just don't have them. And there is a sense that even their forwards who are, good scoring, classy forwards, um, that some of them can be a little bit flaky when the pressure comes on and, you know, could walk away from it easy enough now when you when you have uh, Fitzsimons and the Smalls and these fellas, you know, grabbing, grabbing a, a hold of you. So that, that will be interesting to see how that pans out. You know, they'll probably have enough in them to have a cut, um, but you couldn't see it being sustained, Mike. You, you just couldn't. You just no. couldn't. He couldn't. And let's be honest here, uh, Niall, that, you know, there was a black card played a, a huge part in, in the turn of this match that was looking, you know, it was in the mix and um, it was Gordon Brown. Um, I won't forget his name. Mm-hmm. Gordon Brown, who, 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 who saw the line for a third man tackle, which maybe by the letter of law was a third man tackle, but I don't know, Niall, did, did you see enough intention in it for it to be a black card? I, I'm, I'm, I, I'm always against giving some of the benefit of the doubt in Gaelic football because you know, we're also nefariously minded. But uh, there, I, I honestly not sure he even knew who was coming at him. Um, yeah, one of one of the harsher ones probably the weekend, and I think Rory said there maybe one three was taken off or something like that yep. during one the three. period. Like, and well, that 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 one court the match when when all was said and done because the first half obviously a bit wayward with their shooting, like, but given the elements and stuff like that, they probably would have been relatively happy of where they were and Limerick have looked fit and strong this year in the matches I've seen them and you, you, Cork haven't really you know we saw them day off against Kerry spectacularly badly you know they were so bad in that final 20 minutes and I watched them against Offaly during during the year and they're very lucky I thought to come through that match to avoid relegation uh, you can see they got the job done like they kicked a couple of scores but I thought that was probably Offaly probably left that behind them so it was set off for Limerick um, I thought I, I actually fancy Limerick going in. I know my predictions have been going great this year, but uh, I thought Limerick could have come through that. Like I really did, and I would have loved to see them come through because I've I've just lost hope in Cork. I remember seeing them in Port Leash a couple of years ago against Tyrone, and ever since that, yeah, ever since that day, it was the day or it was Common Twenty eighteen, twenty eighteen, twenty eighteen. Yeah, the great, the great Russ Common Armagh match was the the first match on that day, and Cork Tyrone was one of the worst inter county matches I've seen. Yeah. Shocking, like, and I'm still scarred from that day. Um, but 
listen, you, you talk about it in Kevin's right there. That's all that can go up inside that bubble. We talk about Mayo and the bubble. The court bubble, if they don't at least believe that they've got a chance to sort of may as well not show up. Like, but Kevin's right, short term, that's all it can go in. Short term, we goals, stay in the game for 15 minutes. Don't concede an early goal. I've seen Dublin blow teams away with early goals so often over the years. They'll knock any talk of a team staying with them and within five minutes there's a goal or two. So just stay with them 15 minutes and then you're on to stage two. Get in the half time within striking distance. And that's that's probably all Cork can do. Like there's not going to be a sinner in the country who's going to fancy Cork to win the match. But inside that bubble, they gotta believe or else they may as well just withdraw. Mikey, can I can I make a very quick point on the black card in the list? Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> so and this point I want to reference connected to a Hawkeye moment on the Saturday uh, where an umpire flagged the ball over the bar uh, and before the goalie could kick it out the boys upstairs Hawkeye did and of course it was a it was a wide uh, now officials are only supposed to do this flag things or bring things to people's attention if they are 100% sure that they are correct now, having an umpire flag a point that uh, he sure is over the bar, only to be shown that it's wide by Hawkeye, means he was not 100% sure. Uh, but worse than that, in the black card incident, um, it's pretty obvious from the, the RT pictures that um, the Mayo referee did not see it himself. It was brought to his attention. I think it was Morris Deegan on that near side, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. And again, you cannot you cannot bring these incidents to the attention of referees unless you're fully sure that you've seen what you've seen. So you can't I can't say it to you, Mikey. Oh, he intentionally blocked them. I use the word intentionally there now because that you have to form that opinion. Mm -hmm. uh, so the linesman has to form that opinion. Oh, he had, definitely he intentionally blocked them. It's a black card, and then the referee does it, and then later on that night, or even. Uh, at half time or whenever it was shown again, it was fairly obvious that nobody could know for sure. So, in, in other words, there are people writing checks that they can't cash around here, and they shouldn't be doing it because you you should be one hundred percent certain of the decision. That's all we ever ask referees to get the big decisions right. The small ones we'll have to live with, but you can't be getting game deciding decisions that they're toss ups, they're fifty fifty jobs. That's just not on. Yeah. That's not fair to anybody. But Kev, Kev, the key question though, did Morris Deegan deliver that information to Jerome Henry with a smile? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Rory, final word to you. You are yeah. the supporter uh, look, of I a think, top I, eight football yeah, team. Yeah, I think what you, I think from a management's perspective, I think what you have to do from a Cork perspective and a management perspective and anybody that's got the best interests of Cork football at heart, you have to look at the year as a whole. What they're going to actually get is a very good barometer of the standard they need to get to. They're going to be one of the few teams that are going to end up playing the best two teams in the country in championship this year. So they're not, they'll now know the standard. They're going to probably get rinsed again in a similar fashion to the way it happened in the Munster semi-final. But they're going to get a very, they're going to see it up close and personal. This is, this is the level we're going to need to get to. There's a consistency of selection across the team for the first time, I'd say, in maybe four or five years. They could have ended up in the Talchin Cup. They've had a couple of championship wins back to back. Admittedly, through very lucky draws but look that's the look of the draw we don't decide the rules so they now have i think a base on which upon which to build they're going to get a very good glimpse of where they need to get to in terms of the next level they're going to have some injuries clear up over the next couple of months and i think facing into 2023 in a very in a much more competitive division two than maybe it has been for many years Connor Corbett should come back into the orbit of, uh, and he's obviously somebody that's much heralded around Cork football circles, and we've managed to fend off Australian interest in him. Obviously, got a very bad cruciate injury. He's an incredible player. He he's coming back into the mix. Sean Meehan, Daniel O'Mahony. All of these guys are back into the mix. Brian Hartnett will be coming back into the mix, which is a big weakness, obviously, is around midfield, where I think we'll probably get hosed, and that's going to be a big issue for us um, against Dublin. But I think you've got to look at the, the kind of grand picture here and not just say, right, OK, lost by Dublin again by 10, 15 points and just assume, oh, that, you know, that's typical Cork. I think a mature person that would actually have a better kind of understanding of how football, what football is going on, will actually take a much more 
grandiose view of it and see that there is progress but it's now about building on it because the history of Cork football suggests it's nearly always one step forward and two steps back it needs to be three steps forward now and push on to the next level okay yeah. there we go we might we actually managed to talk quite a lot about Cork and Limerick in the end without yeah, really sorry. talking about Cork <laughs> and Limerick <laughs> listen yeah. we'll leave it there and we'll be back on Thursday uh Niall thank you Kevin thank you Rory thank you and we will be back Thursday to look ahead to the All-Ireland Hurling quarterfinals and the Talton Cup semi final. So, chat to you then. Good luck. Thank you. Bye. How much longer will the referee allow? Dublin lead by a score. And there's the whistle. It's over. It's over. We earned it by winning the last two matches on the road, and that's not going to be taken away from us. What I love in Hurling, I love players that will never give in. He hits it. He hits it. It's over the bar.